All right, y'all ready for First Peter? Uh, man, let's start with this. This may be how it's, your day ended yesterday. <laughs> kind of looking for something. In there. Have you ever been in front of the fridge and you're looking in there and you just, you know, you look inside, you don't know what you're hungry for. And so this has been me, I could call out, you know, Hen, what, is there anything in here that's still good? <laughs> and she says, what are you hungry for? And I say, ah, never mind. Uh, do you think it's true that we, we become what we eat? Or you are what you eat? No, you become what you eat. Well, you know, kind of, kind of both ways. You know, I like chicken. I don't know if that looks good for my future, but, you know, I was thinking about if you went really heavy on turkey, if I went heavy on turkey, what, what that would do to my neck or my chin. But anyway, it's kind of a weird thought. Um, I've heard that you... St- Start craving something that your body is lacking. Do you, have you heard that? It's like if you have a, we used to say this, if you have an iron deficiency, you'll start biting your nails, whatever. But seriously, your body can give you signals what it needs more of. And this could come in handy. I mean, I've tried this on BJ, you know, when I'm craving donuts. I say, you know, I have a donut deficiency. It's serious. It's not a major breakdown in self-control. She doesn't exactly buy that, that somehow I'd be better off on this Krispy Kreme diet, but whatever. But unfortunately, even if that worked in the physical world, you can see where I'm going with this, it doesn't work that way quite so easily in the spiritual realm. Someone can be starving spiritually, in fact, and it can never occur to them to do anything about it that actually helps. You could have this, maybe you have it, this vague feeling this restless longing, this, there's a lack there inside of me, but I'll try to satisfy it with something that can't possibly help. You have this gnawing chasm in your heart, and maybe before you ever knew the Lord, but maybe even a little bit afterwards, you'll try to fill it with something like a, you know, a new Camaro or a cruise to, to uh, Bermuda, and it doesn't work. Now, I want to talk today about... Um, uh, I guess I call it another lion. You know, we were talking about you, you got to master the lions before you can meet the Goliaths or the giants. And one of these daily things that we have to deal with is what I'm going to call misplaced appetites. Do you have a need in your heart? I mean, a critical, serious need, but you will go off in some other direction to fill it to what in the Old Testament is called a broken cistern that cannot hold water. Well, I'm going to get back to that at the very end, but. Uh, I want us to realize that you can often crave something that might be the worst thing for you, just because it tastes good. Uh, I know that I would eat creme brulee every meal if I could, if my wife would go along with that. She's not here yet, so it's just a suggestion. Um, But the deal is our natural cravings are unreliable, and Peter is going to help us on that. He's going to tell us what we need to crave, even if it's not the natural thing we crave. And so enter the Apostle Peter. He's going to give us some help on this. He's going to tell us what to crave. It's going to come in verse 2 of chapter 2, and this is the central idea of this passage. So I think we should just start by reading it. So let's get this. Now, we're going back a little bit. I'm going to go back all the way to verse 22 so we get the whole flow of thought. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly, from a pure heart. That's the fourth command of a series of commands, and we're going to get the fifth today added on. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, because you purified it, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls. But the word of the Lord remains forever. When we started with this a couple weeks ago, I said, bring your flowers back. Anyone else bring their, flower, their Valentine's flowers back? It's been a couple of weeks. These are really looking sad now. I'm, surpar- I'm surprised all the petals didn't fall off this one, but this one is now seriously devoid of anything impressive. This is not a very good love gift at this point. The flower has fall- fallen off. It's like the grass of the field. It just doesn't last. And this one I have no words for. So, but it's, it was impressive when it was given to the lovely woman that received it. But at this point, it is proving my point. And that's why, here they are. I'm going to drop them here so we can, so we don't have room up here. Now, 
So here we are. Let me continue reading. So we have all flesh is like grass. This is what happens to it. And this is what a merely natural love would go to because it can't last. But there is something that does last. The word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Therefore, and here we go, putting away all malice. Now, if you've got the ESV, it's, it makes a, the command here, therefore, put aside. But really, the therefore is going to go down to crave the pure spiritual milk. So I've departed from the English Standard Version. My apologies to them, trying to just make this more literal from uh, the way the original runs. It says, therefore, putting away or after putting away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn infants, crave the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Wow. What's the central idea? It's about what you crave. And so Peter now, through the Holy Spirit, wants us to go after the pure spiritual milk, as if it's the most natural of hungers. He likens this to what a baby would do. So here's the key idea here. Here's the crying infant because you need to crave the word like a newborn craves milk. Now, they do not have to be told, but we do. And so Peter makes it a command. Now, this is a, an, an amazing passage in a way when you're teaching the word of God and then it tells you you're supposed to delight in and truly crave the Word of God. Now, it actually says, crave the pure spiritual milk. I want to explain that a little bit because it doesn't use the word word, but the word spiritual contains the idea of the word. So some of the translations say, crave the pure milk of the word. It means something like spiritual or wordly. It has that word word, logos, right in it. It means something like rational, not physical. Something that relates to feeding your mind, not just feeding your body. So like an infant, of course, is not thinking anything about, oh, I'm going to grow up into salvation if I, if I drink this mother's milk. But when you come to the Word of God, you are focusing on it in that way, that this is not obviously something for you physically, this is something for you spiritually. But it is the Word of God it's speaking of, because in the context, he has just said, it's all about the Word of God. So... He also says that it's pure. It's not like anything else you could eat or drink. It's not like any other ideas that you could really take in, including this sermon. Because this sermon will be, it will be colored by something, you know, something you know, from me that's just not totally quite right on. But when you open the Bible and you read it, there is nothing here that is not completely true. There's nothing here to harm you. This is 100% pure. And there's no errors in it at all. And then, of course, he calls it milk. And we know, like mother's milk is exactly tailored to what a baby needs for growth. In, in fact, it contains antibodies in it that help with the immunity of the child. And it, it's a complete diet. You don't need side orders of onion rings and, and french fries and potato chips to go along with it. I'll have some of that and then I'll wash it down with some milk. No, it's the milk is the thing. All right. But he says, you've got to long for it. You've got to intensely hunger for it. This is a very strong word. So I've translated it, crave it. Let this be a vehement desire of your heart to take this milk. And if, if you see how a baby goes after milk, then you, you understand this is the perfect word for what a newborn is like. He zeroes in. He, he puts everything else aside because it's feeding time. Uh, and you could try to slip a pacifier in there. You know, they do not make a pacifier good enough, even big enough for a baby's hunger when he's really ready to eat. And so you can hold him off for a while, but it's not going to work. You, you just can't do this forever. So, um, so here you've got a hungry child, and he's demanding, and he's insistent, and he's desperate. And he's intolerant of substitutes. And if you change the formula on him, he'll know. Um, there we go. Um, he has this intense desire. Now, I'd hate to break it to you, ladies, but, you know, your baby, as a newborn, doesn't care what color you painted his nursery or, you know, the color of the curtains or, you know, what he's dressed in that day or, you know, what, you know all these cute things that you got at your shower. 
He doesn't care. He cares about one thing, and that is if the food's there, it's great, and if it's not, he is not happy. All right? That's just the way it is. The baby cares about one thing, milk and mom, and they go together. And otherwise, they cry, and the louder they cry, the more you get this feeling of desperation, and the more you get the idea of what we are to be, craving the milk of God and God himself. Now, <laughs> if the intensity of desire that a baby has for its milk were directed towards something less wholesome, we would all be shocked. But this is exactly and wholesomely what our desire is to be like when we see and hear and are encountering the Word of God. Do you desire God's Word like that? That's the question today. And if not, why not? What has happened to my appetite? Now, we know when someone doesn't have a good appetite, there's something going wrong. That's a really pretty good indication it's time to check something out and see what has happened. And I want to say that we cannot afford to be casual about our spiritual appetite and about what's going on here. Because if we don't have a good appetite, the something that's wrong can be seriously wrong. It can mean that I don't even have life. That's why I'm not hungry. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Here's God, he want, and he wants you to come to his word, not as a mere duty, not as some, well, they said, this is what you're supposed to do if you're, if you're a Christian. And so I have to do it. No, he says, I, I need you to want to do it. He wants you to love it, just as he asks you to love him. He wants you to crave it. He says, and it's not just read it, it's not just study it, it's not just teach it, it's not just preach it, it's not just think about it, it's not just searching the word, it's not wielding the word like a sword, we're told to as a sword, it's not even hiding it in your heart, or that could be part of that if that means treasure it in your heart. He wants something more than that. He wants you to long for it, to crave it. You can see this all over Psalm 119. And uh, I've been reading that recently, I read it, you know, as I said last week, uh, it took me about six days to really go through it and, and think about it as I was going along, and I wrote down all the verses that include this. I'm not going to read them all, but I think the first one is verse 16, I will delight in your statutes, I will not forget your word. Uh, verse 40, if I can see this well, behold, I long for your precepts, in your righteousness give me life. Let me jump down a few, let's say... Uh, verse 97. I'm getting a glare from these lights, but I mean, it's okay, it's just me. Uh, I was told I got the beginnings of cataracts, so you know, they give you this little glare, and it's not ha I'm not happy. But anyway, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. How about 111? Here we go. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Uh, and I think the last one that I wrote down was 174. It's right near the end. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Now you can think, okay, well, that's the psalmist. I mean, that's like a super saint. He gets to write the Bible about the Bible. That's pretty cool. And so, but that doesn't need to be me. Wait a minute. This is no super saint. Look at the very last verse of Psalm 119. I have gone astray like a, a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. 176 verses to convince you that you, like a lost sheep, has got to have the Word of God. You've got to long for it. You've got to crave it. You've got to desire it. Now, do you also need to study it and learn it and teach it and preach it and all that? Of course. I mean, there is a severe lack of Bible knowledge in our world. And it's not even a matter of craving it at that point. I mean, I remember a deal way back when, John, uh, when Jay Leno was doing uh, way back when he was doing The Tonight Show, he would do these man-on-the-street on the kind of interviews. And one time he, was, he collared some young people with some questions about the Bible. I don't know why he did this, but anyway, there were a couple of girls there, and he asked them, can you name one of the Ten Commandments? And one of them came up with freedom of speech. <laughs> and the other one said, you know, complete this sentence, let him who is without sin. She kind of worked on that a little bit and said, have a good time, should have a good time. And then he turned to a young man, and he says, well, who, according to the Bible, was eaten by a whale? Now, Leno could have read the Bible a little better for that one himself. It doesn't say whale, but anyway, the confident answer was Pinocchio. 
Unfortunately, that's not unusual. So people need to know the Bible. They know it less and less, but the reason they know it less and less, that is a symptom of a lack in their life of wanting, wanting to know the Word. We don't know it because we don't want to know it. It's not hard to get a Bible in America. But what Peter says here is you've got to desire it. And that's a love word. Without this, you won't be able to read it transformingly. In fact, you probably won't read it very much at all anyway. But if you do, it won't transform you. You'll be like a scholar who doesn't even know God and doesn't think the Bible is true, who studies it like an ancient book or like a piece of literature, takes it apart like the Iliad or the Odyssey as something that's, that's just a part of his research, and it won't transform him. Now, God might get to him in that way. We notice in this passage that it's the Word of God that brings us to life. We're born again. And, and so some people have been startled with what they read. They got it in their hand, and they didn't know it was living. So I didn't know it was alive. But you can think this is a dead book, and you can be dead in yourself, and you can get almost nothing from it. Because you have not learned to prize it, to treasure, to long for it, to love it, as the very voice of God. That's what we want to talk about today. The voice of God in the Word of God. Now, some of us, we're, we're commanded to do something that sounds like the command to do for an emotion. It's like, you know, how much in control are we of our emotions? Uh, for instance, this didn't really happen to me because I loved spinach growing up, but some of you didn't. How many didn't love spinach growing up? So somebody could say, eat your spinach. Now, you can command someone to eat it, but what if they said, and I want you to love it, and you better enjoy it? In that tone of voice, that could be a little tough anyway. Uh, and so, yeah, I could eat it, but to enjoy it, I mean, I can, can, can I control that? Well, I want you to know, first of all, this is just not all about taste. For instance, you can delight even in being afflicted in your life, having trials without enjoying it if you know that it builds character. James 1 talks about that. Consider it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Endurance and then a growth in your life. And so if you love righteousness, you will learn to treasure or even find joy in trials. You see what I'm, where I'm driving here? So I could go to my son and say, if you want to be strong like Popeye, then you will learn to delight in spinach. It may not taste good, but you will eat it and you will find some kind of sadistic delight in it because you want to be Popeye. Okay, so I think we can get that. There can be other motivations for craving certain things. You can crave to eat certain things that produce weight loss because of the goal that you have in mind. You know, I'm craving this weird food that has no calories because I'm actually craving getting into a size 4 dress again. And I'm tired of thunder thighs. So there we go. Or you depend on the goal. Let's say your goal is uh, you get cramps, and so you, get, you start craving bananas because the potassium is going to help you. Not because you love bananas so much, but you hate cramps. See where I'm going with this. So you crave something because it's good for you. Even if it doesn't taste good, it satisfies some other lack that's important to you. You're convinced you need it. And so we're going to start with that today, something about need. But it can't stop there. You have to learn to build a taste for it because there's also that anticipation of the taste when you smell it and, and it's there and it's like if we were, sometimes we cook steak here to get the idea of uh, developing an appetite. I almost had John do that today for us. And you start smelling it and, you're, and you're, well, your saliva just starts running and you just can't wait for lunch and you know, give me a bite of that, please. And we're supposed to start getting something of that from the Word. There is no cook that just wants you to enjoy the nutrition, unless they happen to be cooking in an army camp or, or a summer camp for kids. <laughs> Otherwise, they, well, they want something more than nutrition. They want you to love eating it. They want you to taste it and smell it and say, ooh, that's good, and even how it looks on the plate. And I just wonder, if, is it okay with God if we just do what we're told? He says, read the Bible. And we say, okay, I will do it just because you told me. No, he says, I want you to crave it. I want you to love it. I want you to delight in it. I want you to long for it. 
There is this element of the Christian life that has gotten downgraded a little bit because we're, we don't want this kind of sappy, sentimental stuff. So uh, John Piper writes about this in his, in his book on Desiring God. I brought this here. You should buy this book, not mine in particular, but your own copy and read this book if you haven't, Meditations of a Christian Hedonist. And it's a tremendous book. And somewhere in the book, uh, kind, of, kind of near the end, he writes, gives you seven reasons why he wrote the book. And one of them was this, Affliction, affections, excuse me, affections are essential to the Christian life, not optional. Afflictions are too, by the way. But. And so he goes on like this, I, I'll read a little bit of this, because I, I want to whet your appetite for this idea, but it is astonishing, and for the book, it is astonishing to me that so many people try to define true Christianity in terms of decisions and not affections, affections, emotions. Affections for God, positive things. Not that decisions are non-essential. The problem is that they require so little transformation to achieve. They are evidence of no true work of grace in the heart. People can make decisions about the truth of God while their hearts are far from Him. We have moved far away from the Christianity of Jonathan Edwards. Edwards pointed to 1 Peter 1.8. That's, that's right where we are. And argued that true religion in great part consists of in the affections. And then he quotes from 1 Peter 1.8 that we've already taught on. Whom having not seen you love, in whom, and he's talking about Christ, in whom though not, now you see him not yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. And so he goes on to point out that true religion has two kinds of operations in the soul of the saints. According to this text, love to Christ and joy in Christ. And both of these operations in the soul are affections, not just decisions. Edwards' conception of true Christianity was that the new birth really brought into being a new nature which has new affections, new desires, new appreciation of this or that, and that includes the Word of God. Now, I find this supported throughout Scripture. He goes on to say, we are commanded to feel, not just to think or decide. We are commanded to experience dozens of emotions, not just to perform acts of willpower. And he lists many of them. You're commanded to love. You're commanded to rejoice. You're commanded to have hope. Fix your hope. We've had it already. You're commanded to fear. We had that one in this passage. You're commanded to have peace. You're commanded to fear the right thing. I think I mentioned that already. You're commanded at times even to have grief. And now craving the word of God. And then he goes on to say, I do not believe it is possible to say scriptures like these all refer to optional icing on the cake of decision." They're commanded by the Lord who said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Luke 6.46. And so we go to this. And, you know, you read the Bible. You know you've been commanded to read it. But maybe you don't enjoy it too much. He says, I am often asked what a Christian should do if the cheerfulness of obedience is not there. It is a good question. My answer is not to simply get on with your duty because feelings are irrelevant. My answer has three steps. First, confess the sin of joylessness. Acknowledge the coldness of your heart. Don't say it doesn't matter how, how you feel. Second, pray earnestly that God would restore the joy of obedience in regard to what we're talking about today, the joy of the Word of God. And third, go ahead and do the outward dimension of your duty in the hope that the doing will rekindle the delight. This is very different from saying, do your duty because feelings don't count. You getting the point of this? It's not either or. You obey. But God teaches you to delight. In this case, in his word. So this sermon is not about getting you to read the Bible. It's about letting, getting you to love to read the Bible. To love to know God's word. To get you in it because it is your joy. All right, now, how should you read the Bible? It should be like a hungry baby sucking with all its strength to draw out all the nourishment he can get necessary for life. That's how we should read it. I was going to subtitle this message, Christianity is for Suckers. So there we are. But you know, he's not asking you to... to He's not asking you to enjoy poison. He's asking you to enjoy a sweet mother's sweet milk. This is amazing. All right. Now he's, we can find several reasons why we need the Word of God. And so we're going to go through some of those. So we're going to start with this why question. Why? 
Why should I care about craving the Bible? Because without it, you're going to miss essential things for your life. We need it. Now, one thing the Word gives you is it helps you to be born again. So I'm not listing that one, but if that's where you are, then you need it for that. Uh, otherwise, you're going to, maybe you get into it, but you can get in and you'll never really enjoy it. You can't. Because it's written for people that are alive already in the family of God. But we're going to go to this for number one. Without it, that is without the word and craving the word, your love is hampered by impurity. Now this is a review of where we were last week. Having purified your souls by obedience to, and now I've highlighted the word, the truth. For a sincere brotherly love, one an- love one another earnestly from the heart. Now, we talked last week, like if your love is weak, one of the reasons could be that you're still dirty. That is, you've never been washed up and purified. But how do you get purified? According to this, it says, by obedience to the truth. The truth. Now, where is the truth? That's the Word of God. We get this from the Bible. We get this in the Gospel, it says here as well. But this is what we need in order to be purified. And if we're not purified in heart, we don't listen to the Word of God and walk with it as well as we can at that point of our maturity, then that is going to quench our love. So that's the first thing. Your love is going to be quenched and hampered by the impurity you have because you don't have God's Word in your life. Okay, everybody with me on that? Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, Sanctify them, my disciples, with your truth, your word is truth. All right, so that's first. Second thing, without it, you are left only with what fades and dies. Now, this is pretty serious. If the if only thing you have is um, what you were born with, what you have in your natural life, then everything around you fades and dies. And that's all you have, and including yourself. The world this is an interesting little article. I think this is a little bit tongue-in-cheek, but it says, World Death Rate Holding Steady at 100%. It says, World Health Organization officials expressed disappointment Monday at the group's finding that despite the enormous efforts of doctors, rescue workers, and other medical professionals worldwide, the global death rate remains constant at 100%. Death, a metabolic affliction, affliction causing total shutdown of life functions, has long been considered humanity's number one health concern. Responsible for 100% of all recorded fatalities worldwide, the condition has no cure. And here's a quotation. It says, I was really hoping what with all the new radiology test uh, treatments, rescue helicopters, aerobics TV shows, and what have you, that we might at least have made a dent in it this year, who Director General uh, Dr. Gernst Blatt said. Unfortunately, it would appear that the death rate remains constant in total, as it has inviolably since the dawn of time. So there we are. How many die? Everybody. Caesar dies. The presidents all die. Your barber dies. I went to a class reunion in one of the small high schools that I attended. Seventy people in the class, one-fourth of them were already dead by the time we could get to our 50th reunion. Dead and gone. That's what it was. Now, he quotes from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 to 8 which says, all flesh is as grass and its glory like a flower of grass. The glory meaning its riches, its, its strength, its beauty, all of that goes away. And this is, in a, this is in a chapter in Isaiah. It's a turning point chapter in that book. I wish we could go and study it in some detail. But the center idea of all of that is that the glory of the Lord is revealed. But all flesh is as grass. God's word, that he says, abides forever. But all flesh is like grass. Its beauty goes away. Now, you can help me with this. We already talked about the roses, but let's do, uh, let's do a little quiz here. Celebrity, a celebrity quiz. You tell me who the celebrity is. If you, I mean, there's going to be four of these. If you get them all, you can, you can choose a book in the back when you go. Okay, you ready? Are you on for it? Okay, the first one, yeah, you got the first one right. Jack Nicholson. There he is in his glory days. How did you know that? That is. That, the second one is Bridget Bardot. She was a, you know, a sex symbol of, you know, back when some of us were still looking at women like that. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I shouldn't admit that. Okay, let, <laughs> let's try a couple of others. No, this one is Goldie Hawn. Yeah, that is the, um, that's the laughing girl. And the last one is Earl Oliver. You're right. Okay. Now I know some people don't change that much, so there can be exceptions. All right. Now, in relation to the gospel, he says, and this is the gospel preached. Remember, there's no New Testament at this point. So what we have in the New Testament revelation is the gospel from the apostles. And this all came to be scripture along with the Old Testament that Isaiah is talking about. And so at that point, we have the Word of God as gospel, and it means it's really personalized to you. It's preached to you. It tells you that this is not a medical book. This is medicine for you, for your own soul. And it contains life just as God contains life. And so uh, we could go into some things from this passage. You know, what is living and abiding? It's God and His Word. Every day you can pick up your Bible. Every day when you open your Bible, it's a connection to you and the living God. His Word has the same characteristics that God does. In fact, that little phrase, through the living and abiding Word of God, could just as well be translated through the Word of the living and abiding God. Now, he doesn't remove that confusion. I think it's translated correctly. But there's nothing about the Word that is not true of God and vice versa. So, for instance, the word is powerful. We could go through the passages. The word is truthful. It's holy. It's revealing of light. It's infinite and boundless because God is. But here it says it's living and it's lasting. And how is that true? Well, in a lot of ways. We know the word is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts through all the, you know, all the disguises of this world, even in your own soul. Uh, it is alive because it reproduces it gives life to others as we have here. It never becomes obsolete, right? It's not like a, an, an old letter that's, or an old book that's just not true anymore. So many books, I mean, it, some of your students, you buy a textbook. So I'm going to get a used textbook. And then you find out it's got a new edition just three years later that costs five times more. So why do they do that to you? Now, here's my old Bible. When I went to college, I just bought, I just gotten this Bible for high school graduation. And one of the first Bible courses that I ever taught or took at what's called now the Master's College was a book in Romans. My son Sanford is taking the book of Romans right now at the same college 51 years later. And guess what? If you open to Romans, it's the same book. It's the same exact phrases. It is the same exact revelation. It's the same thing he's learning right now that have not changed in 51 years or I don't care, five zillion years it abides forever. Wow. And this is what you have. You open your Bible and you have something that will never change. It's not going to, oh, no, we don't believe that anymore. I mean, they got that wrong. It never fails to be fulfilled in its predictions and its, and, uh, its promises, its purposes will be met. And it is miraculously preserved, even though it was hated more than any other book. Now, every day you can touch two eternal things, people and the Bible, all right? People and the Bible. That should tell you something where your, pri your priority should be. It's not your stuff. It's not your car. James and Jenny had a, a break-in at their house on Friday. They stole their car and emptied everything valuable out of their house. But they didn't hurt anyone that was in living there. Wow. Eternal things are worth infinitely more than everything else. All right? And that's one reason that we crave it. We need it in that way. We need something eternal in our life, not stuff that can be taken from you. People that say they love you and then they, and then they abandon you. Some of you came here today. You have heartaches in your life because people that ought to be loving you are not loving you. And you come to this wonderful book, and you say, here is a message from a God who loves you, loves you, loves you, never stop. And his word is new every morning. All right. Now, here's number three. Uh, why do we need to? Why do we need the Bible? 
Without it, your growth is severely stunted. Now, this one should be obvious. Like a newborn babe, you desire this, the sincere spiritual or the pure spiritual uh, milk in order that by it you might grow. So you need it for growth unto salvation, he says. And so what's he talking about? He's talking about there is going to come a day when he's talking about salvation, like when everything is done, when you have been perfected. And on the way, how do you get there? You keep feeding on the Word of God. And you keep growing. You get in it every day. Uh, Jesus talked about it as bread, in, in quoting from Moses. Uh, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Sometimes it's called meat. Sometimes it's called honey. Here it's called milk. You get into it. It is what you need for your soul. Uh, Paul talks about it in 2 Timothy 3. He says, look it, you need this because it makes you wise for salvation. That's the way Timothy had been, uh, been brought up. And he says, for the word of God is what? Breathed out by God. For, so all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for what? For doctrine, for reproof, for, in, for correction, for training in righteousness. So that, now don't leave out verse 17, that the man of God may be complete or mature or perfect. That's where he's going with all this, unto salvation, thoroughly equipped for every good work. You need it for growth and for usefulness. So you need the word to be born, but you need it to get big. The baby is best nourished from the very, nourished from the very life from which it originated. So here's the guy that brings you to life, and now through his, the milk that he gives you, like a mother, he is nourishing you for growth. He's building your heart and your life. Now, there are two main things that help you grow. There's A and B. A is adversity. B is the Bible. God enrolls you in the university of adversity. Uh, You're going to be in that no matter what. And in so many ways, that many of our growth spurts have come because we've gone through tough stuff. But then he gives you the Bible. Now, he gives that to you, but you've got to enroll yourself in it. All right? You've got to say, okay, this is going to be part of my life. Now, those um, the A and B often go together. Now, I would say, you know, if I did more on B, maybe I wouldn't need so much A. You understand what I'm saying? If I just get in my Bible more and grow more there, maybe I wouldn't need so many of the trials. But God is going to build me. What he began in you, he will complete until the day of Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1. Now, I like a couple of verses from Psalm 119. Uh, one I have... I have loved for, for decades. It says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now that I have been afflicted, I keep your word. You see how they go? So when God gives you A, then all of a sudden, the Bible becomes so meaningful to you, and you keep his word. And it's not only just knowing it, but you say, I got to do that. I got to live that way. But then there's another verse, and this is 119 verse 92. Um, he says, if your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. Now, he's not talking about just knowing the word. He says, if it had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. So now it's going the other direction. So it says, the more you get into the word and love it and crave it, then when you face trials, they have a different meaning. They do not crush you. you, you in fact, sometimes immediately you can say, I wonder what the Lord has for me here. Instead of thinking, where's the Lord? Why isn't he doing something? All right. Now, Peter adds a little verse that spins out of another psalm, and it tells you that this is all connected with the enjoyment of God himself. Now, I just love this so much. It's my favorite verse in this. Because without the word of God, your enjoyment of God is seriously diminished. He says, if indeed you have tasted that the word is good. Is that what it says? No, that the Lord is good. Now, you might have expected that. You know, if you've tasted in the past that the, that the word is good, then, you will, then you'll long for it. But he doesn't say that. He says that the Lord is good. And he says, if. He's assuming that they did. You couldn't have translated it since, but there's a little warning in this. Like, don't you know that the Lord has been good to you? 
Don't you realize that? The Lord has been kind. I want you to really treasure the word that he uses for good. That the Lord is good. And by the way, the word the Lord referred to here in the Old Testament, it was Yahweh in the quotation from Psalm 34, 8. But here, as you go on in the next verse, as Nate is going to explain to us very well by next week, it refers to Jesus Christ. And sometimes you can go to all these passages in the New Testament that show that the, the Jehovah or Yahweh of the Old Testament is Jesus, that he himself also is Yahweh. Jehovah's Witnesses got that totally wrong, but anyway. So this is Christ himself. Your enjoyment of Christ himself is diminished if you don't come to the Word to find out that and remember that he is good. Good. He is good. What does that word mean? It's not the normal word for good. It's the word for delicious. It's the word for pleasant. And how does the Lord taste? Unmixed goodness. The word can be used for something that's just suitable to the need. It fits completely. It could be used for a garment that's easy to wear. You know, so when you just want to lie around the house, you didn't put what I have on here. You put something that's soft and user-friendly, right? That's comfortable. Do you know the Lord that way? He's comfortable. It can even be used for worthy, worthy to be appreciated. It can mean pleasant to be with. It can mean kind even to those that are broken and lonely. In fact, part of the psalm, back in Psalm 34, it says the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Is that you? How many times has the Lord come to you and he's shown himself that way, so kind to you during the time when you needed him so much? Oh, my goodness. This is our God. Now, Satan does not want you to know God in this way. And that's why he will try to take your Bible from you. I would love if, if, if I had time to go back to uh, Genesis 3, when Satan came as the, in the form of the serpent to the woman, and he says, has God said? So he tried to put doubt on the word of God. Why? So that he could remove them from a knowledge of the kindness of God, the goodness of God. So has God said, and I said, God is just selfish. He doesn't want you to be as God's, knowing good and evil. So you should go ahead and eat what he told you not to because he's just trying to hold you back. There is a God in heaven who never wants to hold you back. But Satan will try to keep you or make you think that. Now, for you to think that, first of all, he has to cast doubt on the word of God. So if he can rob you of the Bible, then you cannot hear God's voice, and then you can make up another God of your own choosing. And you will listen to lies that you never would have listened to before. I remember when my, when my mother-in-law, my sweet mother-in-law, uh, as, as she got old, she lost her ability to speak. And people who met her after she could not talk had to make up a Beulah Sheridan from what they could see. They would never get the impression that she was a brilliant woman. They would never get the feeling or the knowledge that she was an amazing artist. They wouldn't know her because they couldn't hear her speak. And so they could make up a different person. That is what happens when you do not have the Word of God. You make up an idolatrous God, a counterfeit God, a God because the real God is not good, according to Satan. And so you make up a God that you think is good that is not the true God. All right, now I want to pass beyond that, but I want you to think about that. So we come to the Word, and what do we do? We, we, we crave it because there we taste Christ. When you hunger for the Word, you're hungering for God. Um, oh, I think you all get this point. Now, it's because God is hungering for you. The same word for craving here is used in James chapter 4, 5, just a few pages back, where it says, don't you know, he, that is God, jealously desires the spirit he has made to dwell in us. That God craves us. I was thinking about moms and the way, you know, when it's time to nurse, I mean, a mom's looking for the baby, not the baby just looking for the mom. 
right? And there's something in a mother that longs for that child. And there's an eagerness and a bonding there. The milk is sweet, but let's say you're the baby. That all transfers over. Your mother is sweet. And to that mother, that child is sweet. There is this bonding. It's amazing on this feeding on the milk. The care then that that mother gives to this child, even when he suffers. The compassion when he's ill. Love that continues in the face of a mother's own pain. Never counting the cost. Just a mother is known for her self-denial. That's our God. That's our Lord. That is his kindness to us. All right. Now. Turn your notes over, because now we're going to talk about the how. Now, we've kind of started on that already, because if you know your need, what we want to do now is find out how to build your craving for God's Word. I'm going to go through this fairly fast, because I don't have much time here, but I'm going to tell you that there are several things here. First of all, confess, this is number one, confess in childlike dependence that you have needs that could use some resurrection power. Now, you've got to be humble for this. He says, you're like a baby. I said, I don't want to be called a baby. Let me say, Bruce, you're such a baby. Yeah. Okay. That's a little bit humbling. But this is what I am to God. It's a glorious and wonderful thing. So if it's a little humbling, I'll always be that way with God. I mean, he'll always be infinitely older than I am, for one thing. I always need God, totally. And that's a baby. I'm completely dependent on him for everything. And that will never, ever change. God God will never say, well, you're strong enough now. I'm going to put you out on your own. Now, this growth is not to become not a baby. Now, sometimes when Paul talks about being babies, he, he does talk about it as you need to become men. You need to grow up. But this is not here. This is, he talks to all his readers as newborn infants. He wants them all to long for the milk. All right, so here we are. And we need all of this. Milk. We need it. Resurrection power, that is the power that brought you to life, is what you need every day because you're over your head. You put a baby out there, and an abandoned child will die. So you've got to have it. I remember a Super Bowl commercial. I love this. This is three years ago. FedEx ran this deal as kind of a spoof on the movie Castaway. I'm going to tell this story fast. If you saw this movie, you know that Tom Hanks was a castaway on an island, and you know he had Wilson, and he had whatever. He, he survived somehow and eventually got back. And um, the spoof goes like this. The FedEx employee, kind of looking like the bedraggled Hanks, uh, shows up at a, a suburban door, and uh, he gives this woman there, after, you know, after, and he explains that he'd been on an island for five years, and he's sorry it's so late to deliver it, but here it is. Here's the package that he kept for her. And she says, thank you, and then he says, hey, I'm a little curious. What's in it? You know, what did I, what did I bring to you, if I may ask? And so she opens it, and she shows him the contents. She says, well, it's nothing really, just a a satellite telephone and a global positioning device and a compass and a water purifier and some seeds. (laughs) You might try opening your Bible more often. It contains exactly what you need. All right, number two, get rid of poisons and junk food that suppress appetite. Now, we could talk about, you know, the big pacifier here. You know, Satan will give you all kinds of things, sins and junk food and substitutes of various kinds, sort of like eating sugar is going to suppress your appetite until you can finally, you know, find McDonald's. You'll just, you'll just munch on something. Stop filling up on junk food, or you're going to seriously impede the appetite that God wants you to have. And what is junk food? Well, it's, it's all the stuff that you pursue in status and success and, and sex and sports and and music, and all these things that occupy our mind. We constantly think about something besides God. We don't have time for God, and so we don't have an appetite for His Word. Because we fill ourselves on nonstop, you know, Fox News on the election, and we don't have time to talk about how the king of the universe gets crowned. Right? We're not hungry for the Word because, I mean, we got so many books we like to read. I mean, this is, I love this one, and I love to read. I mean, I read a lot of stuff. But if I fill my mind on everything else, what do I have time for? And what does my hunger look like? Now, Peter's point is really more than junk food. It's really the fact that we have put into our life sins 
that keep us from the... Have you ever heard that? This book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book? And that's the way it works. Guilt keeps you from the Bible because it reveals your sin even more. And then when you read the Bible, then it puts forth God and His glory and His holiness, and I don't want to see that. It makes me feel dirtier. So I'd rather not know. Jesus put it like this, men love darkness rather than light because what? Their deeds are evil. Or Hebrews 4.12, the Bible's living and powerful and it exposes you. So I don't want that. Unless I also learn that in God's glory, it's not just that He's over me in judgment, but He's under me in goodness. And when I know that and the forgiveness that comes and the, and the redemption and God in ransoming me, He wants me. And he wants me to want him. And that shows from my side on how much I crave to hear his voice and to know his word. So Peter calls out five sins that you've got to get rid of before you can crave the word of God and feed on it. If you don't do this, then you're not going to be able to go on to the craving. And this is all in verse 1. So he says, putting away, just get rid of it like a filthy garment, unfriend all these sins, Okay. And so there's five of them, and three of them have the word all with them. That is, don't take a convenient one that's easy to get rid of, like, like giving up, you know, eating salamanders for Lent. Uh, it doesn't work. So all malice and all deceit and all slander. And I could define these. I mean, we could do a whole sermon on these sins and why you should get rid of them. Do you have any of these going on? Malice, that is an unloving, ill will attitude toward other people. Guile, that is deceitful, manipulating attitudes, trying to get what you want in illegitimate ways. Um, three is hypocrisies, outward shows, or, or an outward show to appear much better than I am. Uh, envies, number four, uh, displeasure over the blessings of others. Or the way Rick Warren does, I like this, envy is resenting God's goodness to others and ignoring God's goodness to me. And then slanders is number five, all slanders. That's backbiting and cutting other people down, ranking them down, gossiping about them. Even telling the truth about their failings to other people who are not part of the problem or the solution. Now, what are all these things? They are ways of making life work for us without God, without the Bible, and at the expense of other people. Now, he could have used a lot of different sins. He just he picked these five. These are kind of anti-love sins. All right, And he gives these to you. He says, look, you've got to get rid of these or you will not have an appetite for the Word of God because you're drinking poison. You're drinking poison. All right. Now, number three, how do you build a craving for God's Word? You've got to be discontented with where you are spiritually. You know, it doesn't even sound spiritual to say such a thing. But it's hard to get motivated if you think you're as smart and as strong as you ever want to be. Some people say, oh, I'm growing enough for me. I said, man, do you realize what I want to do through you? You've got to keep growing. You've got to keep the Word of God going into you so you can become what you need to be. So be discontented where you are spiritually. Martin Luther said this, nothing is more per perilous than to be weary of the Word of God. Thinking he knows enough, a person begins little by little to despise the Word until he has lost Christ and the gospel altogether. So be discontent. Do not be smug in this. Is, oh, I, I got enough. I learned the books of the Bible when I was a kid. I got it mastered from cover to cover. No, you don't. I don't care how long you walk with God. What, you, you, you just got to keep learning more because God has for you, he, he wants to build you for more power in your ministry and more stretch in your love and be, to be more... In, uh, to, have endurance in your life because you don't know the, the trials that God ha has for you in the future that he wants to prepare you for. You say, I didn't know I needed to be that strong until we had a baby and that baby is broken. So I didn't know I needed to be that strong. And you think, oh, I've got enough. God knows when you have enough. He wants to give you more humility in your repentance and more faith in your prayers, more hope in your attitudes, more encouragement in your words, more laughter in your tears, and more self-control in your passions, and more conviction in, in the way you stand up for God, and more of Christ in everything. That's what God wants, and all of those come through the Word of God. Now here's number four. 
He wants you to be, come on, here we go. Rehearse past kindnesses of God. So as if you have tasted that the Lord is good and kind. And so remind yourself how much God loves you. It's not so much how much you love God. Just remember how much he loved you. How's it going today? What I tell a lot of people as well, much better than I deserve. If you don't even think about any other specific kindness, remember this. Don't you remember how God didn't slay you the first time you told a lie? That by itself, to me, is enough to just say, I have tasted the kindness of the Lord. Why would I want, not want to hear his voice? And then I think of all the other things, he's, ways he's poured mercies upon my life. Huh. The spiritual blessings in heavenly places. The prayers that have been answered. The people in my life that are so wonderful. Um, my own children my amazing wife, all of these blessings. And then you think about your life and you say, well, God never gave me children. I don't have a precious spouse, whatever. What else has he done for you? The mercies of God on you, on your life, are amazing. And Psalm 126, 3 says, the Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. Okay, so now. I want to close with, this is the walk away. I'm going to give you some practical things you can do right away. The first is join a good Bible study. A, a group of, you know, fellow eaters, an eating club. Now, I grew up with that. It was called a family. It used to eat together. Yeah. And we actually ate together. And believe me, if we hadn't done it that way, I would have never eaten anything but Twinkies. But it's there that I learned to eat real food and learned to get a taste for artichokes and other things that I would never have tried. You get in an eating club, so here's your small group, fellow learners of Jesus Christ, and one person has an, and so you share your recipes, and you just come there, and you, and it, you build. Wow, I never knew that could be so good. So you need a good Bible study. The second thing is you need a good study Bible. <laughs> you know why people, and I've got several here, just to give you examples, I've got a ESV study Bible, buy one. I have the NIV study Bible buy this one. You don't need them all, but here's the chronological study Bible. BJ loves this one. She also has the Quest study Bible. She has three study Bibles she uses all the time. You can use the MacArthur study Bible. You can get, I mean, there's lots of study Bibles. Get one, because a lot of us stop, our, our appetite is quenched because we, we get into the Bible, we don't enjoy it because it makes me feel dumb. So I'm reading something, I don't know what that means. Guess what, the, one, the, the things that are hard to understand, there's always a note underneath that gives you a little way to go with that and you can study it out you just even that much now is this the, la the last thing you need to know about the bible no but this puts in your hand something that will allow you to eat the bible every day yeah. and that's really important you can't just feed once a week come in here that is not called eating that's called fasting all right do you get it if you don't eat six days and you just eat one a week that's called fasting that is not what a baby ever does Try to convince your baby to eat once a week. Oh, my goodness. And then feed where you're needy. That's number three. A lot of people, they just open up the Bible and say, I'm supposed to read the Bible. And they're reading in the begats. And he died, and he died, and he died, and he was born, and he died. And they, they don't really get why that helps them. But if you really want to feed on the Word, and, you're, and a lot of times you just got to start with where you're struggling. Now, every passage that you study has meaning for your life. But sometimes when you are hurting, you need to, there's something you're buying, you're already hungry for something, and you need to find that. Call me if you want to say, what's a good passage on this? Because everything I read, I ask this question, why would I go back to this passage? If I'm depressed and discouraged, I will go back to 1 Peter chapter 1 on hope. There are places where you can go, and then you just eat it, you eat it, you eat it, Suck up all the strength that you can from it. Okay, does that make sense? Number four, learn how to actually feed when you read. Now, you can read stuff, but, you know, we've taught a lot of Christians how to kind of understand the Bible, but we haven't taught a lot of Christians how to actually feed on the Bible that they know. Now, if I were constantly forced to eat something that didn't appeal to me in the first place and then, 
and then I found out I didn't really get any real nutrition or strength from it, I would probably stop. And that's the way it is with us. We, we, we come to the Bible, we don't know how to feed on it. So I'm going to invite you to something. On the day before Easter, from 9.30 to 12.30, three hours, I'm going to do a workshop on how to let the Bible that you're trying to master, how to let it master you, how to feed on the Bible. Any one of you could sign up for it. We're going to do it right here. We're going to, we're going to film it. We're going to make sure that it's available. But it's something that many Christians don't know. I do not know how to open my Bible and actually feed on the Scripture so that I learn to crave it. So we're going to call this the How to Crave Workshop. All right? Now, we don't have a sign-up today, but starting next week, we'll have a place for you to sign up. And then you can start craving something besides ribeye steak and a pie from Kathy Absher's kitchen. Now, and then the fifth thing is, a lot of us aren't very hungry because we don't exercise enough. We don't serve anybody. So use your strength and new knowledge to serve somebody, and then your hunger will continue. I remember the first time I had to talk to somebody and witness to them, I realized I didn't know the Bible very well, and I went back and I just devoured it. And serving will always do that to you. You will need more strength. So what are you hungry for? So let's just close this. What do you crave? What you crave will make all the difference whether you cave in to this world of lies. Okay, here's the Goliath part of this. So the lion is that you've got to work on every day is that there are competing things that will take away your appetite. And you say, I reject those. I'm going to be in the Word of God. And if you do that, it will prepare you to meet that challenge that's going to come in your life. You know what cuts between this world and my life? And every Christian is the Word of God. And they say, well, we don't believe that anymore. You say, well, okay, it's in the Bible. The Bible has captured me. That's just the way it is. And you will stand. But if you are not in the Word of God, and the Word of God is not in you, and this is not the craving of your life, then when the world comes around with its lies and says, I want to persecute you because you don't believe the PC thing, uh, it's going to make all the difference that you've been in the Word of God. The love of the truth. The love of the truth. All right. I've gone kind of long today, uh, but I don't apologize. You need to know this. I'll be shorter next week because I'm not preaching. (laughs) All right. Let's pray. We're so blessed, dear Father, to be people of the book, to be able to have a Bible in hand. So many people in this world don't even own a Bible. Help us to long after this thing that we so often take for granted, the Word of God, the Word of God. Build us up, Lord. Accept our worship. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.